We started teaching on the spirit of Absalom, and we didn't get done with that. And so, Sister Furnace is going to go back and read this, kind of a little bit of review where we were last week, because a bunch of you weren't here. 2 Samuel 18, why don't you start right at 10 through 22? Now a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, And I just saw Absalom hanging in a terebinth tree. So Joab said to the man who told him, You just saw him, and why did you not strike him there to the ground? I would have given you ten shekels of silver and a belt. But the man said to Joab, Though I were to receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king commanded you and Abshia and Etiah, saying, Beware lest anyone touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I would have dealt falsely against my own life. For there is nothing hidden from the king, and you yourselves would have set yourself against me. Then Joab said, I cannot linger with you. And he took three spears in his hand and thrust them through Absalom's heart where he was still al while he was still alive in the midst of the terebinth tree. And three young men and ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded Absalom and struck and killed him. So Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing Israel. For Joab held back the people. And they took Absalom and cast him into a large pit in the woods and laid a very large heap of stones over him. Then all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and set up a pillar for himself, which is in the king's valley. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. He called the, na the pillar after his own name. And, and to this day it is called Absalom's Monument. Okay, and I realize I didn't get you started where I wanted to, but that's okay, because I'll just recant the story. There is a spirit that traveling through the church, and especially at the end times, that the devil uses to destroy, and it's called the spirit of Absalom, or actually the spirit of Satan. Now, the spirit of Satan, or spirit of Absalom, wants to overthrow and tear down authority. The purpose of the church is to create spiritual sons and daughters. Now, David had a son. His name was Absalom. Amen? That was his name. So that's why we get the name of the Spirit. Now, the, the highest creation in heaven God made was Satan, right? And he had golden pipes. And he was a very good, and, and they always talk about how good he sang, but I think it's how good he talked. He was a silver-tongued devil. And he, and he got one-third of the angels to follow him and say, let's take over God. Amen? Such a spirit continues to work. See, the devil doesn't have a lot of new things that he does. The things that he does are always the same, but he's awful good at what he does. If you might have noticed in your life, the devil will use the same thing that worked on you before. He just keeps back and getting you over and over and over again. You think we get smart enough that we can handle this, but because we do not understand spiritual warfare in the least in the church. I've been in some of this. There's some of this stuff that we sit around and we, and we pray and, and we call out and, and knock down principalities and holler at them, all sorts of stuff. Did you ever see anything happen? No. That's because our realm of authority is on individuals one at a time. We don't have authority over the spiritual principality of the city. God has authority over it, and we can ask him to send angels to battle with them. But you see, the angels that were with, with Daniel, biggest angel they had, Michael came to fight that principality. It took him 21 days to get there. You see, just so that he could come help Daniel. So he was detained. So there's a lot of battle in the heavenlies. We need to get consecrated on the spiritual warfare we have here so that each individual can be cleansed from what the enemy has put in their heart and mind so that they might be a force to spread the gospel to bring more in who've been damaged. And a lot of them have been damaged by what's supposed to be the church with their false teaching. 
So the spirit of Absalom is the spirit to overthrow. This spirit can work in many different ways. It can work in a church, in a family. All of a sudden, somebody that is sitting under authority and they get that satanic spirit on them and all of a sudden they said, well, I've been so big and I've done so good and I'm so full of pride. I'm just as good as the, as the apostle that's over me. I believe I'll set up my own network and then they work through the network or work through the fellowship and they steal half the churches and they got their own. That ain't the way God wants things to happen. Absalom didn't want to stand authority. Why? Because he was impatient. Eventually, Absalom would have been the king of Israel. All of Israel. So this spirit is working throughout communities, through churches, through houses, through fellowships, and it is working to destroy the work of God. And it will use anything that it can get to make it work. These people that do this sort of things are anointed. They are like the devil. The devil was just full of good stuff. He was anointed. He was a great singer. He was a great speaker. He could stand up in front of people and do the angels and just seem like the greatest of all the angels. How many people have you ever seen that had the Absalom spirit that could stand up in front of a congregation and preach almost like God speaking out of their mouth? And yet... Their life was like a house that was riddled by termites. Termites work from the inside. They eat the entire inside of the thing, and the outside shell looks just fine. That's what these people are like. Their, their, their outside looks just great. They got a shell that, it, that, that and a nice wrapping, you know, just like Christmas wrapping paper all around the outside. But you hit it with a hammer and you find out it's full of wood worms. And the inside is rotted out, eaten up. What's it eaten up by? It's eaten up by sin, and that sin starts with pride. So this thing is working, and the devil uses this thing. And these people appear. What, what did it say about the devil? It says he can appear as an angel of light. When he says Israel went with Absalom, Israel's the northern ten tribes. He managed to get ten out of the thirteen to go his way. As soon as he was destroyed, they ran right back to David. And eventually the inheritance that Absalom would have received went to Solomon who waited and bided his time until his time came. It's not that these people don't have some anointing, but generally they are full of hidden sin and pride. And this spirit works to destroy the church of God. And you can generally spot them because these people do not want to be under headship. They will not submit to authority over them. Now, why am I hammering on this so hard? I've been through this once, had enough. But I still believe in the five-fold ministry of the church. No matter what foul experience I had with the spirit of Absalom working on me three or four different times in three and four different ways. Working on this church. And that is that we are all part of the ministry. That God did not set us here to sit on a chair, but he set us here and each individual in the church has a purpose for God in their life and God has a destiny for them to minister. The great commission is to everyone. Go forth into the whole world, spread the gospel that you might win some. So, as we are taking this core group that we have in this church and we're placing them into ministries, they must realize that the devil will come against them and try to use the spirit of Absalom to cause them to disrupt. Is it because they're weak? No, it's just because the devil's smart and it always worked. He just keeps doing it. 
So one must guard yourself against sin, and you must get the devils out of your life, and you must not let spirits of depression and pride and all these sort of things work against you so that you might not become like a spirit of Absalom. Sometime or another, this spirit has, has worked on us, and we've done something we shouldn't do. Especially if you've been in the ministry. I used to have a problem. I would sit in a service, and if the preacher was lousy, which there's a lot of them that are, and the pride that lived in me made me think that I could preach better than that preacher, I didn't get up and throw him off the pulpit, but I felt like it all the time. I did. Well, pride was within me. The Lord revealed this to me, and he says, not everybody is gifted to preach like you're gifted to preach and gifted to teach like you're gifted to preach, but there is something in what they're preaching that I'm trying to get to you. And you might not like the way they preach. You might not like the style of their preaching. And they might not even be living the way that they ought to be living. But in, from their mouth, the word of God will not return void. And when they speak the word of God, there's something in that for you. And I learned to glean and bring that into my life. So you need to learn to glean what you hear into your life. But if it don't line up with this, you glean that out. Amen? So I believe in the, in the five-fold ministry, and we're involved in an organization that believes in the five-fold ministry of, of apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, so that they might, what are these people called in these positions for? For the perfecting of the saints so that they might do the ministry. There's ministry for everyone? You mean I'm just not a log stumper? That's right, you're not a log stumper. You have a ministry to do in your life. He has a purpose for you, and he has a destiny for you, and he wants you to fulfill in that destiny, and you will be what you should be in God when you get your destiny fulfilled. One short story, oh Lord. For many years I was in the business of raising dogs. I have experienced many dogs, and seen many dogs, that were unfulfilled. As we have played God as dog breeders, we breed dogs to do certain things. And we instill in these animals a destiny as we selectively bred, just like God made people so that there's a destiny in them. You find a dog that was bred to herd sheep and it never gets to do it, you've got yourself a frustrated dog. There was something inside of him that he wants to do that and I've actually seen dogs with shepherd breeding him try and herd cockroaches and crickets. They will try and do what they're intended to do and anything they can find to do. And if you take that dog and you give him just a little bit of training, he'll become an excellent dog and, then, and do what he's intended to do. And he will not be frustrated and he won't eat your furniture any longer. A dog that's bred to hunt. If he doesn't ever receive a, 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 an outlet for that thing for him to hunt, he'll be a frustrated dog and he will be a miserable thing to be around. And the Christians are sitting on the pews being frustrated because there's a destiny inside of them that God has some kind of ministry for them to do, but the pastors are afraid to let them do it, and the apostles are afraid to let them do it because they've experienced the spirit of Absalom before, and they're afraid that they will get out of line. And so there they sat frustrated, unable to do the ministry of God, and the kingdom of God is not built because our purpose is to build the kingdom. Amen? The last thing about the spirit of Absalom is two things to say. When this son of David was killed, it hurt David deep down inside to where he wept and he laid on his face and he cried 
Absalom, oh Absalom. For when a spiritual son goes astray, the father of that son hurts inside and prays that that son might be restored. There's a lot of men standing, I being one, standing in pulpits today that have had sons that turned out and the woodworms ate them and underneath they turned out to be rotten but the father's heart is still there and they cry for those who went astray and they fear to step forth the way they once did because they are so emo emotionally damaged from what the spirit of Absalom has done. The spirit of Absalom, and that's, of course, remember whose spirit that is? That's the spirit of the devil. The spirit of the devil uses another spirit that goes with him to help him along the way to do his work. This spirit, through the centuries, has nearly destroyed the church of Jesus Christ. And people don't even know that it's working in the fellowship that they're in because my people perish for a lack of knowledge. The people perish for a lack of knowledge because the leaders the Spirit's name is Jezebel. I've read books on the spirit of Jezebel and most of the books written on the spirit of Jezebel are actually written about the spirit of Absalom and they don't really understand how this works. I mean, they understand what's happening but they give it the wrong label. If you'll go to 1 Kings 16.31 please. Jezebel means chast. Well, you'd think that's pretty good. But if you really get it, and as I went as deep as I could get it, chast means to be dedicated. But she was not dedicated to Almighty Yahweh. She was dedicated to Baal the false god. Now how did she get any authority? How did Jezebel get anywhere? Go ahead and read the scripture I give you. I think it only takes one, maybe two. I'll tell you when to stop. I'll know where you're at. And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nahab, Nabat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonons, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Okay, that's as far as we need to go. Who was she? Was she one of the 13 tribes of Israel? No, she was a Phoenician. She had spent her entire life and time in a false religion. This is the spirit of Jezebel. False religion. Not the truth of Yahweh, not the truth of Jesus Christ, but the truth or the falseness of false religion that tries to appear as truth. Acts 2.42 says, Not to depart 
from the doctrine or the teaching of the apostles. Paul says it in every one of his letters somewhere. He says, do not depart from what I have taught you. He says to the Galatians, oh foolish Galatians, how quickly you turn aside. You started worshiping in spirit, but now you've departed from the truth. So, involved in a pagan false religion, she came and married Ahab. Now, what was wrong with Ahab? He was the king of Israel. Of the northern ten tribes. Which had already, it seems, was pretty messed up in the northern ten tribes from Jeroboam anyway. He was the king of Israel. He was supposed to run the show. How many know that the head king is the head king? that he's on top of the heap. Amen? That's where he was. But Jezebel was his wife. She had come from a religion of the Phoenicians. It was like most false religions at the time and many false religions that are touring around our country at this time. It was a religion of sex. In the temple, when they went to worship, there were somebody for everybody. What a way to worship, amen? What was wrong with Ahab? He did not have the understanding of God that he should have or he wouldn't have done what he did and he embraced the false religion because he was uneducated because Jeroboam, his predecessor, two or three generations, his predecessor had already weakened the word of God for his own political gain. You will find out that the spirit of Jezebel always operates to work with political systems. Jezebel always ends up riding the beast, and the beast are governments. He was weak. She influenced him. God set a prophet in the land by the name of Elijah and she had 600 of her prophets. Although there were 7,000 who had not bowed their knee yet, that what was the matter with that? But poor old Elijah didn't have good close ties and fellowship with the, what the other ones that were with him. And so he felt abandoned later on because he felt like he was the only one. But because he wasn't well versed and he wasn't the leader that he needed to be, Jezebel started to work with him. First off, if he's a leader he should have been, he would have never embraced her and married her in the first place. Never invited her in. But when we talk about inviting somebody in, who do we need to invite into our life? I can turn anything into an altar call. Who do we need to invite into our life? The first step in being solidly based in Jesus Christ is to know Jesus Christ. He is the one and the only. There is no other way to the Father but by him. Amen? whether you're in the house or you're somewhere else and this is all strange to you, it's because you are not based in Christ. you got to start at the bottom. The number one thing to do so that you aren't taken astray is to have Jesus Christ as your personal Savior that the king of the universe is speaking into your heart and into your life. People are taken astray by listening to men. The 
lot of people that claim to be some kind of preacher aren't close to God whatsoever and they don't even know that they're doing wrong. They'll speak something into you and offend you and and you're messed up. Not even intentional. Because they don't recognize the forces that are coming against them. There have been times when I was not recognizing the forces coming against me. God has been giving me phenomenal revelation of late. But the first thing you need to do is accept Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. And then start to do what he asks you to do. You on TV. To understand what I'm preaching, you need to get into Jesus. You, you watch this program because I'm the most entertaining preacher on TV. You want to see what kind of crazy stuff he's going to do next. But you're wrapped up in a real pretty Christian suit. But underneath, the woodworms are eating away. And you are in a former religion, but denying the power therein. And you really need Jesus Christ. The scripture says for us to examine ourselves to see if we're truly in the faith. You've heard the preaching of the word. Do you line up? Or are you just dressed up? Or are you just a shell and underneath you're all eaten away? Receive Christ into your life. Repent of your sins. Turn away from your sins. Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, I need you in my life. I ask you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I repent of my sins, and I want you in my life forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Find our TV episodes at youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Visit our website at anchoredinfaith.org. Our phone number, which is area code 319-828-4815. Our email is tv at anchoredinfaith.org. And find us on Facebook by typing at AIFGC into the Facebook search box. We are actually a small church. If you call our 828-4815 phone number, Leave a short message and make sure to include your phone number so we can call you back since we do not have caller ID. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.